gentlemen, welcome to another of the State Historical Society of North Dakota's Conversations with Scholars, dealing with the history and culture of North Dakota and the Northern Great Plains. As in the past, this series is funded by a grant to the State Historical Society of North Dakota from the North Dakota Humanities Council. And we're very pleased to be able to continue these series with the council's support. Our guest is Dr. Robert Brugman from the University of Chicago. Our subject for this event and other series is the history and architecture of the North Dakota State Capitol. Welcome, Dr. Brugman. Thank you. To begin our, our conversation this morning, where does the North Dakota Capitol fit into the national uh, capitals around the state, around the states of, of, of America? Well, the uh, North Dakota Capitol is a real anomaly. First of all, it's one of the very few capitals that was done from the uh, First World War on, so that we have very few things to compare it with. A couple others have been done since then. Oregon has been done, and um, Hawaii is a recent example. But there are very few that have come after it. Um, in terms of what came before it, it really, is, again, is a very strange departure from tradition. The uh, previous capitals had all been, uh, virtually all, have one of two types. Either they were great colonnaded Greek temples, like the, uh, for example, the, the uh, temple at uh, uh, the Parthenon in Athens, the kind of thing that uh, Thomas Jefferson did when he started his design for the capital of Virginia. Or they were, on the other hand, they were copies, little copies, um, modified, of course, of the state of the um, United States Capitol with the great dome in the center, which is a tradition that ultimately goes back to Rome and to classical um, antiquity. But uh, North Dakota, for reasons that I'm not sure are entirely clear, uh, comes at the end of this long tradition, and it dispenses with both of those things, so that you don't have the great dome, you don't have the colonnade. I think the thought was that because this was a modern, up-to-date state, that we needed a modern, up-to-date capital to reflect it. And the idea that somehow you would make it into a building of an era that is long since passed was no longer necessary. So instead, the architects, in this case, um, well-known Chicago architects, Holabird and Root, decided that they would take the two parts that were needed for the capital, that is the legislative chambers on the one hand, and then the offices, the bureaucracy on the other, they would put the legislative chambers in a building of its own, which has two um, parts for each side of the legislature, connect it with a memorial hall, a, a place to congregate, to gather before sessions and so on, and then connect that on the other side to a very high office building, which would house the bureaucracy. Um, this was rather shocking at the time, and it hasn't really been followed up. It's, it's still rather shocking. It's quite a surprise to come on the airplane into Bismarck, look down and see the one tall building for miles around, and rather than having it be the uh, first national bank and trust of North Dakota, it is, believe it or not, the state capital is quite a, an amazing thing. Are there other skyscraper capitals in the, in, in the United States, and how does that fit with the North Dakota capital? Well, there really aren't skyscraper capitals. There are capitals with towers. And that's a long tradition, too. There have been towers marking public buildings all the way back to antiquity. But the, um, the, in the United States, there was a move to, to do this, to try to experiment with towers, starting about uh, 1920 with the Nebraska State Capitol, designed by a very famous architect, Bertram Goodhue, who decided to put the um, capital in the shape of a great square, right at the center of the town of Lincoln. And at the center of that, where the two axes crossed, he put a great tower. But that tower was mostly symbolic. It was a kind of a modern replacement for the dome. Um, this theme was taken up and expanded upon in the next decade, in the early 1930s, with the capital for Louisiana. And what the architects did there was to put the chambers, as was customary, on either side of a central feature. And now the central feature was a tower. It was, a, it was both a memorial tower, it was both a, a, a symbolic thing, but it was also, in this case, had offices in it. So that was the true prototype for um, for North Dakota, but there's quite a bit of difference because in Louisiana it was still a symmetrical building with the two wings separated on either side, and the tower was largely ceremonial. That was its main function, was a marker. Here, all of that symbolic content, that is the centuries-long tradition, was just thrown out, and the architect said, well, let's create a new tradition. If most of what's done in the capital is actually paper-pushing, or 
important office work, let's say. Uh, we might as well acknowledge that. Let's get a new symbolic um, form in which you've got a small, low legislative chambers, which suits their needs, which is actually used very seldom, only several months out of every two years. And then let's put the offices in the kind of form that's most convenient for them, which is in the 20th century a high office building. And therefore you get this form in which you've got the two things yoked together in what looks still to us, I think, rather strange juxtaposition. The, the, the skyscraper, you, you've used the term symbolic with regard to the skyscraper uh, motif several times. Um, how is it, what does it symbolize? Well, for us, I think, in the United States in the 20th century, it symbolizes offices. It has not always been this way. The, the tower, of course, is one of the oldest and most venerable forms of architecture um, from the time of the uh, Babylonians and the ziggurat um, and the obelisk and the pyramid right on through. It's always been a very potent symbol. Um, we, in our rather secularized, godless 20th century, have taken those sacred forms, which they were forms that were sacred. They almost always involved um, building something that was a great deal more than just utility, and it was for the glorification of something more than just man. We have taken them and we've created something um, new, which is the, uh, we can call it the Cathedral of Commerce now. Uh, the five and ten cent store magnate uh, Woolworth put up the tallest building in the world. He called it very straight-facedly the, uh, the uh, Cathedral of Commerce because this was a great symbolic skyscraping form usually reserved for the worship of God now in the, in the uh, service of five and ten cents. So basically what you have is a, is a process that takes it from the worship of God to the worship of commerce, and where does government fit into this symbolic uh, uh, uplift uh, of, of a skyscraper? Well, I guess if you were cynical, you would say that uh, the earlier forms, using the dome, for example, the dome of St. Peter's, to use it on the American capital, was a good sign that this was a God-fearing country, one that hoped that laws would be in accordance with divine will, and that if you take this analogy a little further, you might say that in North Dakota they finally abandoned the idea and left God out of the equation altogether, that now our laws are done and, and um, the laws are enforced in the manner that you might do in Chase Manhattan Bank in New York. So I guess we've, we've taken our, uh, this may be a, a good symbol that we've taken our moral values and our ethical values from someplace else. Does it symbolize anything about the landscape, do you think? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, one of the things that you just can't tell about the North Dakota Capitol until you get here is the way it, it meets the site. It, it has a very large capital grounds, beautifully landscaped, and from this, you come up out of the soil, you have this kind of pla uh, plateau or ledge that you get with the, um, the hall and the memorial buildings. And they're in limestone. They're in very beautiful limestone, very beautifully put together, very simple. It's almost like a, a bedding kind of thing in a, in a stratified limestone quarry. And then you get to this tower, and the tower then suddenly erupts from the plain, and it's the tallest thing around. It's in a relatively flat rolling landscape. It is just the antithesis of nature. It's something that, that marks a spot. And I think it does that very successfully. I think it accounts for the fact that the state capital seems to be so closely associated with Bismarck and with the state by people in the, um, people in the state. So it's, it's a way of dealing with nature, but, but I think more by antithesis than by um, mimicry or by imitation. So the, symb the symbolism of the capital may well be uh, as, a, as a symbolic triumph over nature. Yeah, I think that's probably true. I think that uh, in a state like North Dakota, which um, is rather um, harsh sometimes and climactic uh, changes, it's a, it's a place where you're always quite aware of nature. Nature doesn't simply sit back and, and let you enjoy life and, and uh, sit under a mango tree and eat the fruits that fall off. That's not the nature of North Dakota. I think maybe the, the reason that North Dakota capital is, is so austere, is so... Um, is so uh, stripped down, so grand in a very simple way, may in fact be this, this opposition with the land. I think also the color is, is so interesting, that the color, which is all, all through the capital, it's, it's colors of wood, colors of variegated stone, of marbles. Um, there's a lot of, of ochres and yellowish, reddish, brownish colors there, the same kind of colors that you see about this season outside in the landscape. You don't see flashy blues or uh, deep saturated oranges or reds. It seems that it's very much a, a building that has the, the land in mind in the, in the color scheme and, and the forms of it.
So the building itself, even in its form, it representing a triumph over a harsh landscape, and then it's in its internal composition, representing a, a, a harmonious, uh, would, it, would that be fair to say it's, it's, it's in harmony with the landscape? It represents, maybe the building itself, all in all, may, may, may represent a compromise. Yeah, I think, it's, um, I think it's a playing off of the landscape. Remember that most state capitals are in the center of towns. Now, unlike European um, countries where they tended to put the capital in the main city, we don't have that tradition in the United States. In the United States, they seem to have gone out and deliberately gone to smaller places, to Albany, New York, to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, to Springfield, Illinois. These are typically not the cultural centers of the state, and they're not usually the garden spots of the state either. They are usually places that were set up, and their main reason for being is the state legislature. But even in those places, almost every case, the state capital is a thing that's embedded in the city fabric, that all around it you've got fairly tall buildings, you've got lawyers' offices primarily, and, and all sorts of other things. But uh, in North Dakota, they set aside such a large tract of land that it sits really in splendid isolation. So you have more of the playing off, I think, of the, the forms of the architecture and the land than in virtually any other capital I can think of. I can't think of any other capital offhand in the United States where there's such an intimate connection with land. That's very interesting in that sense. Uh, the architects for the, for the North Dakota capital were Holliburton and Root from Chicago. Uh, First of all, can you provide any background about these individuals? Well, how did they get to be the architects for a, a building out here in the middle of the prairies? Yeah, um, Holliburton Root was a very old um, Chicago firm by the time they took this commission. Uh, they were founded in 1880 by William Holliburton and Martin Roach. Um, by the late 1880s, they were the premier, one of the premier Chicago firms for commercial buildings. And they remained commercial architects throughout their existence. That is, they did uh, department stores, they did office buildings. They were not primarily architects of uh, fancy public buildings or representational buildings. Um, the, as their career went on, the buildings got bigger and bigger. In the teens and the twenties, they became the Midwest's best specialists in hotels. They did most of the major hotels from the Muehlbach in Kansas City to the Deschler in Columbus, Ohio. Um, three or four of the biggest hotels in Chicago, the Palmer House, and especially the Stevens, which was at the time the world's largest hotel and was that way for 20 years from the mid-1920s. Um, Holliburton and Roach, the two founding partners, died in the 1920s. But by that time, a new generation came along, which was the son of William Holliburton, John Holliburton, and he took for his partner a friend of his whom he had met in the Army, John Root Jr. John Root Jr. was the son of the famous John Wellborn Root, who was the partner of Daniel Burnham in the 1880s. In other words, the great rival of Holliburton and Roach was Burnham and Root. So in effect, the two more or less joined forces in the 1920s. And from the mid-1920s on, I think it's fair to say that Holliburton and Root were the preeminent architects in the Midwest. They were the best known. Um, I think by that time they had eclipsed almost all their rivals. And they became more adventuresome. Um, it's unusual for this to happen. Usually firms have a burst of energy when the principals are in their 20s, the 30s, the 40s, and then it gradually they lose momentum and they start getting hospital commissions and prison commissions rather than the really snappy places where they could make a mark on new design. But uh, Holliburton and, and Root had their, their absolutely were at the apogee of their career in the late 1920s. From 1927, when the firm changed names from Holliburton and Roach to Holliburton and Root, through about 1930, approximately, they were on top of the world. They had commissions all over the United States. Um, they had many government buildings, most notably the county courthouse for Racine County in Wisconsin, the um, Minneapolis, the uh, St. Paul City Hall, uh, Ramsey County Courthouse in um, St. Paul, Minnesota, Birmingham, Alabama, um, and quite a lot of other places. So they were quite a logical um, firm to choose. If you were in the Midwest and you wanted a prestigious building, they would be probably the people of choice that you would go to. And I think they probably would be likely that someone in North Dakota would tend to do that. The other place to look was perhaps the east coast of the United States. But I think that there was a great deal of suspicion and animosity between the, the west and the east so that if you were in a place like Bismarck and you wanted to have 
the best that there was without going to this sort of suspicious, tainted uh, New York City uh, architects. And Lord knows what you would get when they came to Bismarck. You weren't even, couldn't keep your wives safe if the uh, New York architects arrived. <laughs> you went to something that was much closer to home, much more familiar, and that would be Chicago, St. Paul, Kansas City, a, a town like that. And of all those towns, I think that Chicago was the, the largest and had the largest core of architects. So I think it's rather logical that they would go to uh, Chicago and Holborn and Root for the commission. So the Capital Commission chose an established firm with, a, with a, a basically a, 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 a reputation that extended far beyond the region itself. What kinds of buildings uh, would have attracted the North Dakota Capital Commission to Holborn and Root? Well, I think they probably had looked at the uh, public buildings. I'm pretty sure that the building, um, I, they would have looked at the two buildings I've talked about, the courthouses in Racine and St. Paul, and they would have looked at two buildings also in Wisconsin, the um, uh, laboratory building by A.O. Smith for A.O. Smith Company and the Forest Products Laboratory, which was for the federal government in Madison. All of these were um, very widely publicized prestigious commissions, and they went from on the one hand, a, um, a very sedate public building, which the Racine County Courthouse was, to, at St. Paul, a rather spectacular um, building on the inside. It was uh, quite austere on the outside, but once you got inside, it had a long memorial hall with a 30-foot high onyx sculpture that rotated, spotlit and rotated, so very theatrical. That's on one hand. On the other hand, with Forest Products Laboratory and the A.O. Smith Labs, uh, these were among the most razzle-dazzle modern buildings of the era. The A.O. Smith building was almost a complete steel and glass curtain wall, years and years ahead of its time. So I think those were the buildings they probably knew. They then talked to Holliburton and Root. Holliburton and Root came up. There was an interviewing process. They talked to quite a few other architects. And um, I think that it, they, were, they felt very comfortable because Holbert and Root had done so much work, it was so experienced dealing with clients, and had an absolute 100% gilt-edged reputation for honesty, dependability, bringing the building in um, at budget within the allotted time, which I think all were virtues very highly prized in North Dakota. I think you're probably very correct in that. Uh, how do you suppose the, uh, the, that the architects were able to convince, people, uh, convince the North Dakotans to step away from the traditional style for a, for a state capital, the dome and, and the massive structure there on, under it, and then move to a skyscraper model? That I don't know. Uh, it seems that this was an unusual um, selection process and that there was no competition. There were no preliminary designs. The architects didn't have to commit themselves beforehand. They had free reign to do what they wanted to do. And I, that's something I don't really know. I I'm, suspect that a great deal of this had to do with the commissioners, the building commissioners here in North Dakota. Um, this is a, a story that, um, that I think remains to be looked at thoroughly, but I'm very strongly suspicious that it was the North Dakota clients who were as eager to do something that was new, that was efficient, as Holliburton and Root were to give it to them. Now, where the specific forms came from, I, I'm pretty sure that came from the architects, but I think the spirit was here, that they wanted a building that was up-to-date, that was modern, that was not superfluous. I think that there was the predisposition to want the kind of thing that Holliburton and Root could give them. Okay, and so Holliburton and Root was able to establish uh, then the good rapport and to, uh, with the basis of their prior work to uh, demonstrate that they were capable and competent. Uh, what kinds of models do you suppose Holliburton and Root used, or is there any evidence of modeling specifically in the design of the North Dakota Capitol? No, this is really one of the um, most interesting of their commissions in that it's hard to know where these ideas came from. There are several preliminary designs that show that they, but from the very beginning it seems that they were working from the idea of putting the legislature in one place, the office in another place, and then the, the problem was how you connect them. But I don't, it seems that they never wavered on that. There's one design that shows a more or less traditional building, a rather compact building about, oh, I would say eight or ten stories high, uh, elongated, with no real indication of where the legislature would be inside it. I don't know what that design was, was used for, but it seems that once they started in on the project, that the initial thing um, that they did was they interviewed everyone to get their requirements. And I think that the, the thing that struck them most was that because the legislative chambers were used only a few months out of every two years, that it was just crazy burying them in a building where they had to be heated and lighted and um, taken care of and so on 
and that everyone would have to walk around and work around it. So I think that was the initial decision. You put it outside, you put it away where it can be left um, by itself when it's not needed, and you integrate all the other departments in the most efficient manner someplace else. And that, I think, is why the, the, um, uh, this dichotomy occurred. As far as a model, there isn't anything else that really looks like it. And uh, before, there have been a few things since, um, but really the United Nations building in New York, for example, is probably the closest thing I can think of to um, a, uh, a recent reusing of that form. You have the, the low building, a very sculptural form of the, the um, what is that called, the assembly building. Mm -hmm. And then next door, juxtaposed to it, in rather stark contrast, you have a beautiful glistening steel and glass skyscraper for the secretariat where the offices are. Now, the North Dakota Capitol, of course, 1931 to 1934, was in a style that was still coming from the classic um, traditional style. It's actually um, symmetrical if you look at it along the long axis. If you look at it through the, the corridor between the legislative chambers, it's almost symmetrical on either side of that axis. With the United Nations, we're talking about 1948, 1952. We're now talking about a whole new era. This is the European modernist era. That building was heavily influenced by the great French architect Le Corbusier. And so you have an entirely different method of coming at it. But I think that because the fundamental way of deciding how the program should be expressed was the same, that you have forms that even though they're quite different in their execution, are very similar in the basic concept of the way they're disposed on the site. Now, if symmetry in terms of expressing the needs of government was part of the, of, of the motivating force of, of that push the architects to provide this particular design. Uh, how do you explain the lack of attention to the court, the Supreme Court, which is, after all, one of the three equal branches of, of, of government here? Well, I think it's very, um, very odd all the way around. I mean, in the first place, if you look at the building um, the way it is, you say to yourself, with the two branches, well, if, if you take anything like relative size or any other measure of importance, it's obvious that the bureaucracy completely overpowers the legislature. And notice that the governor, the main um, officials, are at the grade level. They're at the first, second, third floor. And that as you go up in the building, it becomes the minor functionaries, which seem to be exalted in that building. So I think it's perhaps a little bit strange as a kind of a, of a symbolic content, and probably a, a un, not really a desirable symbolism, but one that was unavoidable. Uh, because you could put the governor at the very top and, and have the building splay outward for have some kind of um, symbolism of that kind. But first of all, I think that that would make it more difficult of access, um, that symbolically the governor ought to be closer to the people. And maybe it was just they said to themselves, well, it's really more honest this way. I mean, after all, government really is a lot of people working on their desks at the most m mundane level. Why not just express that? But the the fact that as you look at the building from on axis, it's that entrance way that's at the center, but it just doesn't have enough weight so that you've got the tower on one side, which kind of feels like it's pulling the composition off to one side. It, it really is a kind of a strange, it was a sort of a strange thing uh, to begin with. I think it must have left a lot of observers very uneasy. And then the question that you ask about the Supreme Court is even more troubling. If there are three branches, why is it that one of those branches is submerged entirely in one of the others and in the executive, um, not even remotely close to the legislative? So I think that probably was symbolically a major problem. It also was a very small room compared to the spaces that either of the other branches got. So I, I guess that probably you could consider that a, a, a problem, a flaw. I also suspect that the program here came directly from the state. I'm, I'm sure the architects translated that. It wasn't their desire to make the Supreme Court uh, subsidiary. But the addition in which the Supreme Court now is, goes on the other side to almost balance the, um, the legislative chambers, that's a very logical extension almost. Now, of course, it's, it's very peculiar in one sense in that you've got this great axial way in a, in a garden leading up to the center of the building, and now you've added a, this huge piece onto the right, further unbalancing it. But in the other way, you can say that, yes, indeed, it, it may have tidied things up because now you have a, a symmetrical composition around the, around the office tower. 
I guess the remedy for this, if you really wanted to, to solve it, is to move that whole park over about 50 feet, and, and then you'd have the thing <laughs> right up to the, to the office tower. And then you'd really be celebrating the office tower. <laughs> I guess there's no solution to this. Well, I'm, I'm very interested in, in, in this whole question of, of the symbolism of the building itself. And I'm wondering, uh, as you go up in the buildings uh, to the uh, 19th floor uh, observation tower, uh, why build an observation tower on a public building? I think the, um, the idea of an observation tower uh, is, has always been associated with high buildings, no matter what their usage was, from the Colossus of Rhodes on up through the Empire State Building. Whenever you did a building that was conspicuously higher, it seems like a natural desire of people to go up to the top. And I think it doesn't, I think that that probably is very little dependent on the function of the building. It's just as much true in the Eiffel Tower, which is a fair building, as it is for um, the, well, the, the windows on the world and the, the, the uh, World Trade Centers. It, it really, I don't think, matters so much. I think there's this natural inclination of people to want to get to the top of something that's conspicuously high. And I think for a public building, though, of course, it probably even has more significance because when you do get up to the top, you look around and everything you see is, is under the sway of that government. So I think there's an added symbolic um, content there um, and certainly is quite an impressive view from the, from the top of the North Dakota capital. And again, it has that, that feeling that you probably wouldn't get from any other capital that you've got a rather small, fragile, man-made uh, community around it. And then beyond that, and quite quickly beyond that, you're out into the open countryside again, from whence the wealth and the, and the whole reason for North Dakota's being um, spring. From the land itself. Uh, did the capital serve uh, Halliburton Roots' uh, reputation nationally or internationally? Um, that's hard to say. It was very much publicized, very much appreciated in the architecture journals. The big American architectural journals, architectural record, architectural forum, uh, covered it extensively and very <coughs> sympathetically, very um, laudatory comments. But the timing of it was rather bad in that, um, well, the timing of Halliburton and Root's career altogether, they were at the apogee of their career, the peak of their success in 1929, just at the time of the stock market crash. They had a few jobs that kept them going. This one was one of the major ones. Um, this was the biggest project, the biggest construction undertaking in the whole country for much of the time it was under construction. Um, then shortly after that, they did the work on the 1933 Chicago Century Progress Fair. And that as well was a great feather in their cap. So they were riding very high in the mid-1930s. The problem was there was no work. So even though they would be on, I think, almost anybody's short list of five major firms in the country by 1935, it still was not enough to give them anything to do. So their, the work in their the, the employee force in their office, for example, dropped from over 300, which it had been in the 1920s, down to a handful, literally eight, ten people in the office. And it wasn't until the late 1930s that things started picking up again. And they got a few commissions here and there, the Statler Hotel, now the Capitol Hilton in Washington, D.C., a huge laboratories building for Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois, the uh, um, Technological Institute, and a few other jobs. And then came some war work, and then the end of the war, and they should have been ready to, for the firm to take off again. That, that would have been the logical thing to happen. The problem was that in 1945, John Holliburton died. He was already in his 50s, I think. Uh, John Root, by this time, had become an older man. And there was no new generation this time ready to take up the challenge. And so what had, become, what had been in the late 1920s a very avant-garde firm by comparison with other mainline commercial American firms had become rather thought of as rather stodgy, perhaps unjustly, but they were still doing buildings with limestone cladding of the kind that they were doing in North Dakota. So it's hard to know what North Dakota did for them. Certainly in the 30s, it, it greatly enhanced their reputation, but didn't get them any work because there just wasn't work to be had. Did they follow up with the, with the same basic, I mean, did it teach the firm anything in terms of its subsequent commissions and building the skyscraper? Was that, was that part of, their, uh, of the subsequent structures that they designed and built? Well, the thing about that is that they never had really another chance to do a public building of that kind. Um, they did, after World War II, um, do, as I say, a few more buildings, 
that were limestone clad, that were rather austere and, and classical in that way. But then by the mid-1950s, competition from the new wing of European modernism, the glass and steel box of Mies van der Rohe and Skidmore, Owings and Merrill, which by the way was the Chicago firm that really supplanted Holabird and Root in the kind of upper echelon of commercial firms, um, that it was a new, a new aesthetic. And Holabird finally decided they had to drop their old one, that is the classical reduced limestone kind of architecture at Bismarck, and do something quite new. So they started doing curtain wall buildings, um, not very successfully for quite some time. They did have some public buildings. They did largely, I think, on the strength of their earlier reputation, they did a very large complex at Evansville, but it looks very different now. Now we're looking at what you would call modern architecture. This is steel and glass architecture and bears virtually no resemblance to, to North Dakota. So the building's reputation was immediately very prominent nationally, and then it and its architect, architectural firm basically lost favor or disappeared from the record? Um, they seem to, I think that, that they weren't forgotten exactly for quite a long time, but they seemed irrelevant. It seemed like the world had moved on to something else, and these were large monuments of something else, of another era. Now, what's interesting is that we now are in a period in which the steel and glass buildings, in turn, have been um, reviled and, and um, discredited. And we have a new era in which there's a, a real growing attempt and desire to go back to the principles of classical architecture, to make an architecture where you know what a public building is, and it's going to have a dome again, and <laughs> columns, and so in other words, we've come full circle. But interestingly, in coming full circle, the full circle that we've come back to is the United States Capitol and the classical Greek temple, not to these very uh, difficult, demanding buildings of the 1930s that stood at the long, at the end of that tradition. We'd rather come back to the easier, more accessible things of the early republic and uh, the, the uh, colonial period in the early republic. So I have a feeling, though, that as the, as the wheel sort of cycles, that, that we tend to go through all these cycles of history, but we're speeding them up. So I think that probably uh, not too long from now in the future, we'll, we'll be seeing things again, a great renewal of interest in North Dakota capital, not just for the building itself, but also for what it can teach us. So I, I have a feeling that, that this line of inquiry isn't played out. It was just temporarily interrupted in the, in the 30s. If I may, I, I'd like to interject a question with, with regard to the national reputation of the North Dakota Capitol. Is it a building that is known? Um, I'd say no. I, I think that if you had asked an older uh, traditional architect in the 50s and the 60s, they certainly would have known the North Dakota Capitol. I think that as these people now have faded from the scene, that younger people um, an architect now in his 20s or 30s, 40s even, would probably never have heard of it. Um, it's not in any of the standard histories. Um, it's been in no standard history written since World War II. And um, it's, it's almost impossible to find an illustration of it. The only way anyone would ever know about it is if they happen to be looking back in the journals of the 1930s. So I'd say that it's, pro and the other, along with that, I'd say that since the Bismarck is quite hard to get to, it's just not at all on the kind of route that people take going back and forth between the, the capitals and places where they might get a lot of commissions. There just aren't a lot of um, big commissions to be had in, in Bismarck in terms of architecture. So I think very few architects, historians, um, or almost anybody else would actually know about the North Dakota capital now. So the building basically has no national reputation, at least in architectural circles at all. I think that's probably true. I think it's just completely unknown. Now, uh, does it have anything to teach modern architecture? Oh, yeah. That I think it's, it certainly does. And, and I'm pretty sure that as, the, as tastes change, that um, the building will be rediscovered in a very big way. And um, it'll become, um, I, I think, probably a sort of a, almost a cult object. I'm sure it will, because anything that was really important in one era, that people were tremendously... Um, emotionally moved by, enthusiastic about, and that certainly is the case for North Dakota. It moved people, I think, in a way that some of these big domed piles never did because they thought they were doing something new and different and more honest, more open, more expressive, really, of the way government was. And all of that is true. And I think that when you have an emotional, genuine emotional 
heartfelt response like that to a building. And I think, if I can gauge from some of the things I've heard since I've been here, that that's still some of the feeling that North Dakotans have with that building. They may have forgotten that it actually dates as back as far as it does, but they do have some kind of sense that here is a building that is specifically about them, not about Louisiana or about Maryland or some other place, that it really is about them. I think that any building that's like this, that can get that kind of response, will come back again and will be there for future um, uh, generations to look into, to study, to try to come to terms with. Well, I think that there's very little doubt that, it, that the, the state capitol is the single most known building in the state and the one that is probably the one that uh, most citizens would identify as the symbol of North Dakota. Uh, a couple of other questions with regard to the capitol and its architecture. Uh, where do the North Dakota architects associated with the capitol fit into the scheme, into the scheme of development and growth of the, of the capitol building itself? Now, that's something I'm not entirely sure about. There, we need a little bit more research, um, I think, as well. The, the um, associated architects were two gentlemen, one named De Reamer from, I think he was from Fargo, and a man named Kirk from um, Grand Forks, I think. He may have the locations reversed. May, it yeah. could be. Yeah. Um, and they were put together, associated as associated architects, the two of them with Holabird and Root. Now, their tasks were spelled out very specifically. They were supposed to um, produce the working drawings, and supervised construction. That means that the design was entirely out of their hands. And I think that's probably true, that they had nothing to do with the design. That came from Halbert and Root. But there's still quite a lot that happens to a building that is important in the stage of making the working drawings and construction supervision. And I know uh, just from the little evidence that I've seen so far that there was quite a lot of dispute during the um, construction period about who was responsible for what, who was to be paid for what. There was a, a very um, acrimonious um, squabble about uh, fees for the building. And uh, this went on for months and months and months. It was finally settled in a little parley in Minneapolis, um, uh, I think a year after the building was finished. And Harvard was, I think, very, very upset, the firm that they ended up paying for lots of travel expenses and all kinds of expenses they didn't feel were justified, which they finally did pay. Uh, so I know that these, um, these architects didn't quite get along as best they could, but I think that uh, all things considered, it seems to have worked out pretty well because the building is one of the best constructed, best put together, most carefully detailed buildings anywhere in the country. So the partnership did indeed work out in terms of the actual construction. Yeah, I think that the, the squabbles they had about who was going to pay for the sick leave for the man from Kirk's office when he was in, visiting in Chicago and fell sick, I think those things no one will care about 20 years from now, just like they don't care about whether the Parthenon leaked. I mean, you're not, <laughs> we're not worried about things like that in the, in the broader sphere, in the realm of architecture. I think we're worried about what actually was built and on the site and I think there, one of the things that I think you can say about the North Dakota Capitol is that it, it bears scrutiny, probably bears closer scrutiny than, than almost any building of the era. Lots of buildings of the 20s and 30s that are much more uh, famous. Let's say, um, oh, just to pick one out of the hat, the Paramount Theater in Oakland, California, a glitzy movie palace that was then remade into the home of their symphony. That's a very spectacular building. It's also a building that if you look very closely, you find every shortcut known to man in construction. It's a cheap building. Um, it's a building that went after effect at any cost. Well, not at any cost, in fact, at very little cost. Uh, the North Dakota building, on the other hand, was a building that took no shortcuts. There is no corner that was cut there. They didn't have to. It was in the time of the early depression. The labor was cheap. There was good labor to be had in North Dakota. And they did everything perfectly. And that really tells, in a building that's now over 50 years old, a lot of upkeep and maintenance help, but it's a, it is probably uh, one of the best kept, best maintained, best conditioned buildings um, in America from that era. There probably is no building that is in better shape and more intact than the North Dakota Capitol. I guarantee you, you could run for office saying things like that about North Dakota's <laughs> capital here. Um, let me try to put this, this capital building and extend and, and our conversation into a broader context at this point here. Uh, the state capital came from a Chicago firm whose roots extended into the late 19th century. Now, what kinds of uh, national and international philosophical impulses motivated the individuals who were involved with that firm? 
Well, I think that um, the, the larger picture that we have to look at this, the, paint, the picture we have to um, see it as backdrop against, is that in the world of architecture at large, the um, 20th century saw just upheavals and revolutions in culture. The new music, people like um, um, uh, the, the new painting, people like Picasso and Matisse, um, the, um, the new atonal music, um, the, the, the absolute shock of the new modern world of James Joyce and literature um, was a, a profound um, change in the Western cultural tradition. And this European avant-garde modernism was, uh, took off in the 1920s. Then there was a very sharp reaction to it in the 1930s, then became established, almost institutionalized, in the 1950s. That's the backdrop. And that backdrop was playing out on the continent of Europe while this was going on. In the United States, there was some awareness of this. People looked over their shoulders and they saw these shocking forms. Um, they may have heard about the riots at Paris at the opening of the Sacre du Printemps. But they, uh, this, was, this was largely something that was foreign to the United States. So I think in the United States it took more of a direct course that it went from a more florid classical architecture of the late 19th century through a purification period in the 1920s toward a rather stripped down um, austere classicism in the 1930s. Now what's interesting about this is that by the time it got to that, through this long process of filtering, of purifying classical architecture. The result of it, ironically enough, looks very much like things that you might see in Moscow in the 1930s, in Berlin in the 1930s, in several other European countries, where they had gone through a phase of tumultuous modernism and then had come back to a more uh, solid, more traditional kind of architecture because they found that those new forms weren't satisfactory. They, they simply couldn't bring the people along with them. So Russian constructivism, probably the most dramatic experiment in 20th century architecture to throwing out the past, voiding altogether the classical tradition, had largely played its course. No, I shouldn't say that. It didn't play its course. It was squelched by Stalin is what happened. But it largely had come to an end by 1931. And the kind of architecture that you saw in Moscow in the 1930s was a very um, heavy, weighty, uh, ponderous classicism of the kind you get in the Moscow subway, which in the end looks surprisingly like the kind of buildings that you see in Bismarck, let's say, or um, if we're looking at Moscow as the extreme left wing of the spectrum, we can look at the extreme right wing of the spectrum and look at the buildings that, that Adolf Hitler was building in Berlin at the same time, the um, new chancellery building, his plans for a great new Berlin, at both extremes, those buildings don't look very different from what you get right in the middle someplace with a building like the um, uh, North Dakota Capitol. So this worldwide ferment in the early 20th century led to a surprising unanimity of approach in the 1930s. And in fact, I think that if we were to say there was an international style of any period, that probably the strip classicism of the 30s was as international as anything else we'll find. The North Dakota capital then could as well fit into, the, into, into Moscow or, say, Rome under Mussolini or Berlin under Hitler? Yes. It, I think it could have fit very, very well into those places and would not have looked strange. Um, it's also true of quite a few buildings in the United States, many post offices done by the WPA, um, some courthouses, federal buildings. It, it is very much of that um, type of building. It, it does, it's more careful and it's more thought through than most of those buildings. Um, it's not quite as, as glib and as formulaic, but that is the, that stripped classicism is the um, style that we're talking about. So we're talking about basically a, a, a very clean style in terms of ornamentation. Yes. But we're also talking about a, 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 a strict attention to, to functionalism as well. Is, is that true? Well, it's a... Um, I think that the, the thing that, that distinguishes classical architecture, perhaps, from post-war architecture, is that you start with form. That you, you get a form that you think fits a function, and you stick with that. Whereas if you talk about post-war architecture, typically you say, let's forget about the form, let's put it aside altogether. We want X number of square feet for something. Then, let's see, the closest thing we want to it is this other 
piece that has X number of square feet. We put them together, and it's almost like a mechanical process. Then you get yourself a bubble diagram, so-called, um, and you put a wall around it. Well, it's completely the, that's the, the so-called modernist way of doing it. And it's completely opposed to the classical way of doing it, which was discrete units, rectangular, simple geometric solids, or semicircular sometimes, that were then uh, chosen for their appropriateness and then juxtaposed very clearly one against another in a kind of rational, um, usually axial symmetrical arrangement. So a completely different approach post-war to these 1930s buildings, even though the, the results sometimes look the same. So the North Dakota State Capitol is a building in which the, the parts each are very easily read, simple geometric forms that you can see from the outside. The other thing about it, of course, that you mentioned is that it's quite unornamented. There is almost no applied decoration in the North Dakota State Capitol. There are approximately a dozen, I would say, pieces of sculpture, um, relief and high relief sculpture by Chicago sculptor um, and artist Edgar Miller. But that's the extent of it. The entire rest of the building depends for its um, ornament, not on applied decoration, but on the intrinsic beauty of the materials, on the veining, on the magnificent um, veining of tropical woods that are cut in book fashion and then opened up so that the, the grains mirror one another, creating very um, uh, rich, very uh, beautiful patterns in the wood. Is that uh, a characteristic of 1930s building as well? Uh, it is, of the best, yes. Um, because when you had a, a kind of building that was as, as uh, bare, as, as stripped as these buildings were, if it weren't done in beautiful materials, it would look just terrible. It would look really um, shabby because there's nothing else to look at, nothing to pull, to draw your eye. No columns, no capitals, no pediments, no uh, large relief sculptures for the most part. So you have to have beautiful materials or it'll look terrible. Well, let me ask one other question with regard to the use of materials. Um, in the North Dakota capital, uh, although one is, of course, overwhelmed by the mass of the building itself, there's a lot of glass. There's an extensive use of glass in that building. It is, does that represent a compromise between the European constructivist traditions that, you're, that you've been discussing? I may not have the terms right here, but the European traditions and then this more modernistic tradition of the, uh, that, uh, of the 1920s. And then you've said that the 1930s building represents more or less a compromise between those two traditions. Does that mean? I'm not sure it's a compromise. Um, and I don't know to what extent it's actually a response to Europe. Uh, you can see it would probably come to the same thing in the United States, even if Europe had simply been set adrift and been someplace else. Surely Halliburton and Root knew the people um, that were doing these revolutionary changes in Europe. They were not, they were interested but not entirely sympathetic. They believed, as did most Americans, as did most people generally, that the European modernists had thrown the baby out with the bathwater, that with all of the problems that traditional architecture had, it had some very good points too. The European modernists threw it all out. Now, Harvard and Root knew about the European modernists, and they were interested, but uh, they simply wouldn't, um, they, I don't know how much they actually borrowed. If they did borrow from Europe, it was more from what we would now call Scandinavian modern. That was a modern that was at once had many of the principles of European um, more radical modernism, but still loved the fine materials, the, the warmth, the, the natural woods, the fabrics um, that had been traditional in architecture. That's where they probably looked. Now, in terms of where the glass came from, where the uh, dramatic um, colonnade of the uh, Memorial Hall with its very large bronze columns and almost a sheet of glass. That was striking and it was shocking and it was rather new at the time, but the origins of that I don't know. I think they are just as much to be found in American architecture, American um, office buildings of the early century that had huge windows necessary to get light in before they had electric uh, lighting, then you would need to go find it in Europe. Remember that the Europeans, for all that they talked, built very little. Someone like Le Corbusier, the most famous of all the European modernists, had built virtually nothing by 1931 when the North Dakota capital was started. Um, a couple villas for, expense, for expensive villas for private clients, but he had never done a public building. He had never done a big housing project. He had never done a big building period. He had just done rather small houses. So that's a very interesting question and very hard to, to really get a handle on. Um, it's the same question always asked of Frank Lloyd Wright, for example. 
the, in a, his most famous building of the 1930s, of just this period, falling water, has great horizontal cantilevers of pure white uh, coated uh, concrete that cantilever spectacularly out from the cliffside. Well, you can see this on the one hand as a continuation of his earlier interest in the prairie house and the spreading horizontal forms. On the other hand, I think you would be quite right to see it as Frank Lloyd Wright response to European modernists, these long, horizontal, unbroken, flat, white planes with sheets of glass that go behind them. But to what extent it's one, to what extent it's the other, I think that's what's always interesting about architectural history. It's very hard to know uh, exactly where all this came from or what went through the minds of the people to create the kind of form that they ended up with. The North Dakota capital, then, if I can uh, try to summarize your, what you've said, basically represents a continuation of, but a revolt against, and a compromise with worldwide architectural trends of the previous two or three decades that led up to the 1930s. Yeah, exactly. It's part of a long, long tradition of simultaneous affirmation and denial of the classical tradition, which starts in a very conscious way in the 18th century, at the time of the Industrial Revolution. Reformer after reformer, a gentleman named Durand in France in the early 19th century, then the most famous French theorist of the 19th century, Viollet le Duc, then through the theorists of the late 19th century, all intended to take the classical tradition and make it new, make it something up to date, something modern. And every architect was interested in doing that, at least up through the 1930s. But then what happened was this radical break that the European modernists of the 20s, it was finally accepted by lots of people in the 1950s and 60s, at least for big commercial buildings. And we did something else for a while. And now we have a rather strong reaction against that, back to this tradition that was through continuous reform um, operated from the 18th century all the way up to fairly recently. Well, I've been very interested in hearing you say that the North Dakota capital will come back into vogue here and become a symbol and a learning piece oh, over, I'm sure over, that's over true. the remainder of the 20th century. Uh, to what use do you think that this building will be put as a learning piece in terms of our national architectural trends and, and, and what will, well, I'm obviously asking you to predict the future here, but um, what kinds of use will architects put the capital uh, to? Well, I think that, um, that uh, we, there's always a tendency to, to like what um, the past generations did and then to, to have a great deal of difficulty with, dislike, even, even hate the kind of thing that the father or the grandfather did. And so I think that the, um, we're having such a hard time seeing it just because of that and that it will change really dramatically over the next 10 or 15 years. Now, the exact ways is, is, the way, is what you're asking me that it'll be used. I think that um, what uh, a lot of architects are searching for is an architecture of conviction. That is something that isn't simply based on fashion. That uh, a Michael Graves building one day, a Richard Meyer building, a Philip Johnson building the next day, it's all the same, it's all interchangeable. And they're all quite different one from another, different bases, different materials. I think this kind of um, scattershot, um, uh, will-o'-the-wisp kind of fashion architecture leaves most people very disquieted. They would rather have an architecture that seems to have more conviction, that seems to have um, some kind of system of beliefs behind it. Now, I think that when the North Dakota Capitol was built, there was a whole system of beliefs in place. And ultimately, if you get right down to it, this rests at, at the foundation level with a belief in a divine authority. You simply have to have that if you believe that there is an absolute beauty, if you believe that some things are inherently more beautiful than others. And the classical tradition rests on that assumption. So you pretty much have to believe in God if you want to believe of all those um, following um, kinds of ideas that flow from that that are necessary for a classical tradition. Now, I think that what we've lost here is not the architectural forms. I think we've lost that basis of common belief in absolute beauty, in an absolute of any kind, a god, a higher authority of any sort. And I think that this groping back toward forms that are more coherent, more meaningful, more universal somehow, is a kind of attempt groping backward, almost from, from effect to cause, to try through the forms, through what's tangible, what we can get our hands on, to create consensus, 
to create a belief system, to create things that we know we believe in, and perhaps by doing that we will in fact believe them, we will have that consensus. So I, that's a funny sort of answer, but I think there's something very truthful in what I'm saying, that it's the kind of tangible thing that you can grasp, a building, a piece of architecture like the North Dakota State Capitol, is a touchstone to what you might be able to recapture in the way of common beliefs of really deeper feelings about what life, man, God, architecture are all about. Do buildings really mean that much? Well, I think they do. I think that um, the fact that people get passionately excited about buildings, um, think for a moment about the pilgrimage to Santiago de Compostela in the Middle Ages, or think about the, um, the, the um, pilgrimage of the Islamic peoples to um, the Holy Lands. Think about the uh, Europeans going to Chartres or going to St. Peter's in Rome, I think that they're not going to an abstract concept. They're going to a very specific site. They're going to a piece of architecture. And it's not that they go to revere the architecture, although sometimes that gets confused, but they need a focus of their, th of their thoughts, of their highest aspirations. And architecture frequently does that. Of all the arts, it's the most public. It's the one that has the most day-to-day um, -day contact with needs, wants, and feelings. And so I think, that, I think that architecture very often does that. And I think that the kind of building we're talking about, the North Dakota State Capitol, I'm not making too great um, a, um, claims for it in that I think that of all the government um, agencies that in a state like this, the, the state is relatively close to um, the people. It's something that's not a, an abstraction far, far away. It's something that they can very clearly see and um, have some kind of sense of. And I think that they get that through the Capitol building. I think, it, I think it's enormously important and that architecture does, um, truly does play that role. The Capitol as symbol and reality and as the, the representation of a belief system. Then. Yeah, let's call it symbol, reality, and myth because those two things are interchangeably, um, are, are sort of intertwined. They may in fact be the one and the same thing. <laughs> Whatever. Uh, <laughs> one other, I mean, I have no other questions here for you, and our time is running short. I'm wondering if you might want to have, might take a minute or so and, and summarize what you've said. No, I don't want to summarize, actually. I, I uh, can't even remember what it was we have said. <laughs> I think we've gone from the classical Greece to the moderns and from uh, agnosticism to, uh, to the most Catholic of, of buildings and so on, so I don't know how we can summarize the whole world in two minutes. But I, I just did think, I would say that... Uh, that it has been such an interesting experience for me coming to see this building because I think of all the buildings that I've studied by this firm, there are few of them that I had less idea what they were actually going to look like because this building, more than any other, depends on the setting. It depends on where it is, it depends on the light, it depends on the city, it depends on the fields around it. And uh, I think that uh, seeing it um, coming in on the airplane, seeing it at night lit up, just dominating the landscape, um, standing on the other side of the Missouri River looking across this great expanse of magnificent landscape with this um, lit up tower at the end um, has been a really interesting experience for me. I think more than any building of Hollaburton and Roots, it, it says so much more in reality, in, in place, in sight than it does in the black and white photographs through which it's always known. Good. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. We've been Discussing the North Dakota State Capitol with Dr. Robert Brugman from the University of Chicago. This is another in our series of discussions with scholars concerning the history and culture of North Dakota. It's funded by the North Dakota Humanities Council, produced by the State Historical Society of North Dakota. My name is Larry Remily, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Mm -hmm.